Hi, welcome back. Let's um, try to start panel one on time. Now, the theme for panel one is new players, new models, and new audiences. And the chair for the first panel is Mr. Gilles Demtos. Gilles is a very dear friend of the Asia Journalism Fellowship, a dear friend of Ellen. And um, he's currently working in public policy and government relations at Google APEC. Previously, Gilles was director of Asia, Juan Ifra. So welcome, Gilles. I'll let you um, introduce the panel as well as your three panelists. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Carol, and um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I'm very grateful to uh, AGF for their invitation to moderate this panel today. I, uh, before joining Google, as uh, Carol mentioned, I, I've been working for the World Association of Newspapers for 15 years, and in my previous quality, I, I was a regular participant in the AGF meetings, and by switching to Google six months ago, I thought, oh, they will never invite me back, and uh, I am, I'm glad to see I, I, was, uh, I was wrong, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm very grateful. Um, and all the more because uh, in my current job at, uh, at Google, I'm, I'm part of a, a cross-functional team that is global and that maybe includes some 200 people that on a daily basis exchange ideas, emails, readings, uh, projects around the news industry and how to uh, invent the news for, for tomorrow and, and make news publishing, uh, news publishers thrive today. So, which is pretty similar to what I was doing in my previous quality. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm really happy to, 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 be, to be here once again uh, this year. Um, I think that the, the uh, title of this first session is a great way to, to start this conversation. Uh, new audiences, new players, new models, and in, I think it's, it's, it's great to look, uh, to look ahead to look what's new and what uh, brings new, new energy and new blood to our industry. Um, if I may start with a small personal anecdote, um, I'm, I come from, from France, from a relatively small town which is called Bordeaux, um, which is famous for wine. But apart from the wine, there's not so much things in, in Bordeaux, it's just a nice, laid-back, you know, provincial town in France. But there I met uh, once a guy who, funnily enough, has the same age as me and the same name. He's called Gilles, but Gilles Raymond. And he had launched a new startup. So at some point, a few years back, I was interested. I said, oh, I was going on holiday to my hometown. And I, asked, I told him, well, we should meet, maybe have a coffee. And I thought we would, we would have a conversation around, oh, the news industry is so difficult and it's so gloomy. And, uh, oh, you know, times are hard. And I met this guy and he was just like, you know, news is great and uh, there are so many opportunities. I mean, that's a fantastic business. And I, and I was so impressed. Uh, so I was so impressed that immediately I also invited him to speak at some conferences in Asia. And maybe some of you heard him in, in Bangkok or I mean, a couple of times we had the opportunity to bring, to bring him or his colleagues. The, the new startup was called the, uh, the News Republic. And uh, surely enough, I mean, his enthusiasm and uh, his uh, vision and his sense of the business for news paid off. And uh, a few years ago, he sold the News Republic to a China conglomerate for over $50 million. And, uh, and now he's still in the news and still with the great ideas. And for example, he has a new startup where he tends to try to help journalists to protect their sources and to protect their work, etc. So there are many things exciting uh, happening in our industry today. And uh, again, I think it's great to start the, the conference on this tone. And to discuss this, I would like to, to invite on stage our three uh, speakers uh, for this session. So Professor uh, Ang Penghua, Mustafa Kasim, and uh, Simon Park, could you please join me on stage? So we have a nice uh, variety of, of speakers as this panel. Uh, on my right, Professor Ang Penghua is a very famous uh, figure of the uh, journalism industry in uh, Singapore and beyond. He is also a professor at the Wikimwi School of Communication and Information at the Nadiang Technological University in Singapore. But he's not like your regular uh, academic. He's uh, someone who also uh, is passionate, so passionate about, about news and the future of information that he 
he's participating and has participated in many forums, groups, and discussions. He has been in 2016 the uh, president of the International Communication Association. He has been part of a working group on internet governance that was appointed by the then UN Secretary General uh, of the UN, so Kofi Annan. Uh, he is also on a council for, I mean, the legal advisor to the Advertising Standard Authority of Singapore. And I cannot list all his engagements, but um, his uh, thoughts and uh, comments in this discussion will be very interesting in, in that quality. Then further on my right, we have uh, Simon Park, who's a, a, a consultant in uh, media and he collaborates as much with traditional media who are transforming, uh, as well as with startups that he encourages, he helps test and, and launch their, their project. So he's a media thinker and consultant and brings a lot of experience with a, a wide uh, range of, of companies. And finally, on my left, we have uh, Mustafa Kasim. So Mustafa was one of the uh, person who stood up when, because he was born at least after 90, right? <laughs> so that's uh, uh, the young generation, and he's an entrepreneur in media. And again, this will be very interesting to, 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 to hear from him. So what we'll do is that I will invite each speaker to start with a 15-minute presentation. And, uh, and after that, we'll have a conversation together and, and, and with the audience. So to, to start with this uh, uh, first presentation, I would like to uh, invite Professor Ang Peng Hua to, to speak. Okay. Thank you. Please welcome him on stage. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, uh, thank you and a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, I don't ordinarily speak about uh, the media business uh, because my own work is on media law and policy and um, on governance. But this year, I was uh, teaching. A, I am teaching a class on uh, media management. Uh, actually, taking over from uh, Arun Mahisnan, who was the deputy uh, here at, at IPS. So there's a connection here. And part of uh, what I was doing was to uh, this, this course that is was when I designed the syllabus uh, was to look at the issue of uh, media, media disruption. So this uh, talk is actually relevant and comes out of that. Okay. So let me just check. I think it's skipped. Yeah, okay, so um, let me begin the problem and then talk about uh, some solutions and then some uh, results, right? So uh, I think the problem that we see is that for, for the news uh, area, uh, people expect uh, free news, right? We expect the news somehow to be free, uh, we get it, right? Um, secondly, we, we know that the young are not reading that much news. I know that because I ask the students, and my own daughter doesn't read the news unless it goes through her social media feed, right? The third one, of course, uh, Google uh, and Facebook, um, they're taking away marketing and advertising revenue, um, partly because they've been successful in reaching out to this target audience, right, your millennials. And then um, we see what we call below the line uh, marketing, which means that not advertising, but some other ways to connect with people and, and get them to, to view the products. So that's a problem sort of overall uh, on, on that front. Uh, for the industry itself, um, uh, one thing about the media business that it's not a regular, not a sort of a normal business in that we have some uh, civic responsibility. So in the news today is of course the issue of fake news, and you can see how uh, the media plays a very significant role in a democracy. Uh, a, lot of you, a lot of you probably know that, uh, but it's research also supporting this point of view that actually without the news, uh, actually you become more uh, conservative, or in the US become more Republican. So the news plays a part a really critical uh, balancing part in having the democratic uh, element in our, in our countries. And then, of course, the fact that the profits have been driven down by the online. I unfortunately do not have data about Asia, uh, but from the US, you can see a dramatic decline, uh, more than half, right, uh, from uh, 07 to uh, 2015, right? So this very dramatic decline. Imagine your own uh, salary going to half, right, 10 years later, right? That's very dramatic. Okay, so um, what is the solution that we're aiming for, right? Uh, I think many people are thinking about revenue to be viable, okay? Now, interestingly, part of the course that I'm teaching, uh, we have this, uh, in fact, we just spoke about this just uh, this past Wednesday, the issue of a balanced scorecard, meaning that when you try to uh, grow a company or a managed company, you don't look at one number alone, you try to look at balance. So, for example, if you aim for revenue, right, 
what is the cost to your, uh, to your own employees. So in a balanced scorecard, there is one looking at internal. What is the cost to employees? If you are listening to your customers, what are you doing listening to, uh, uh, inside, right? So for example, one way to, easy way to, to grow revenue is forget investing in R&D, right? But that's not good in the long run. So you need a balance when you look at um, uh, revenue growth, and I hope the AGF uh, folks, when you go back and become editors, uh, do consider the need for this balance. Because we do, um, I think Sri was talking just now about India. I lived in India for a year, and I kind of know the media situation there. They are very successful. Uh, the biggest uh, online site is an Indian site, right? Uh, the Times of India, they got TOI. Uh, yet they're doing some things that are really unethical, like paid news. Why? Get more revenue. That's going to kill them in the long run, right? Because you are hurting your long-run prospects. The balance scorecard gives you this idea of the short term and the long term, right? So in the long term, uh, we don't just want to grow revenue, but we want to grow resources for reporting, right? We want to balance that for sustainability. Okay, the question, of course, is why don't we just go online, right? Isn't that our solution? If everybody's there, why don't we just head there? Right. So let's look at some of the success uh, and, and failures, right? Okay, so some challenges in going online, right? The first one is the low average revenue per user, right? Especially with the mobile sector. So even more, and, not, and you know that people are looking at mobile more than uh, your laptops or your computers, right? And this revenue is, even, is going even lower, right? Um, actually, I saw this way back in 1997 now, and I started a dot-com dot site that's still around. Some of you may have seen it, expatsingapore.com. It's been sort of given to a friend who was uh, running it, right? Um, and just compare, right? I did, uh, I had a friend, and so he advertised on his site, and I told him, you pay per click, right? And I know this is, just, for some of you, it's very, very novel. Pay per click, you pay $2 per click. Anytime somebody clicks, you get $2. I get $2, right? He advertised on a country club uh, uh, site because his was a, a moving company, moving art and stuff, $800 a month. Right? And he wasn't sure of the results. Mine, $2 per click. Every month, I was billing him $50. The country club was charging for the magazine $800. So even then, right? So imagine now, and now nobody charges, I don't, I don't think anybody here charges $2 per click through, right? Nobody. Okay, people are like, wow, you did $2 per, per click through. Um, but those are the times, uh, you can see 97, and now, now you can see how these things have really, really fallen. Programmatic advertising, uh, that's where you, you know, when you uh, read and they follow you on the news and uh, the, uh, the ads may come up. Uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, I'm renovating a place that I have and uh, looking at some Danish lamps, very nice, you know, and a uh, good price. And suddenly all I'm seeing are these Danish lamps coming up in my uh, news feeds. I think you probably know that, right? It's quite amazing how these guys are really targeting uh, you, right? Okay, we have competition large companies, I mentioned that. And then uh, my own thing, which I admit I do, ad blockers, right? I think many of you have that as well. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, ghostory.com is one free one. It's a good one that I use and, you know, for privacy as well as uh, ad blocking. So the challenge is going online, right? Okay, so now how do we get revenue? Let's look at some successes, right? Um, so paywalls have been some successes, uh, I put here, but then micropayments have not done well, and I'll show you uh, one side at least that have this, right? But paywalls enable you to have custom content, meaning that if you pay, you get it. You don't pay, you don't get it. So there's some room for that, and this custom content has been shown to be uh, successful to a point. And then on, uh, on data analytics, that again has been successful to a point. Um, and typically, data analytics is to improve your, um, your campaign performance. You can, like my friend's case, right? When I told him $2 per click, I say you can monitor, and I'll tell you when I'm using your case uh, to show to a client, you know, to somebody else, I'll tell you that I've clicked through, you don't pay me for that $2, right? But you can monitor, you can see how uh, your campaigns are, uh, are doing, right? Wall Street Journal, interestingly, for I uncovered this, that there's 60 signals to indicate your propensity to subscribe. So when I look at this, wow, it's pretty scary, right? They, they know how you're going to behave when you get onto their site. Some signals that they, you send that you may not be aware. In the big data space, it's typically called your data exhaust. You're giving out data without even knowing that you are giving out data, right? Um, so data analytics is, of course, a big one. And then uh, final point about your closer relationship with the reader, that's, that's good because then it builds your, your loyalty, your connection. Okay, on the revenue front still, uh, crowdfunding, Crowdfunding doesn't really work because some research shows that when people give once, they are less inclined to give later on. 
So it's actually a one-off. It's not forever. So this is kind of based on, on research. One site, uh, Google had a part to play, uh, Jazz, you probably know of this, right? Uh, a contributor, I will show you uh, later, close out of 21 months, okay? Readers pay to support the article. So before the, the work is done, they show we are doing this project, typically investigative, and then you click and you support, you give money to, to have that done, okay? So this is the site, you can uh, go through the site.com, okay? You see that they paid 270,000 pounds to 5,000 writers, right? That means about 50 pounds per writer on average. Not a lot of money, right? And if you divide by articles, I divided, it's about 350 pounds per article. There's not, a, there's not a lot of money for the kind of work that they're doing, right? You get an op-ed, you can get a few hundred dollars already. So you can see that this model uh, tried out, won a Google uh, News Innovation Award, still didn't quite uh, work out, right? Uh, this one is kind of interesting, crowdfunding, right? Uh, this is out of Holland. They raised some money, and then um, it's still around. I checked, it's still around, okay? Um, and it talks about what they've, uh, what they've learned, okay? I'm going to speed up a bit, time catching up, okay? There are some other models. Uh, look, uh, the Guardian one. I subscribe to Guardian also, but it support um, um, uh, the good uh, reporting. And then some donation and foundation-funded um, uh, size as well, right? Okay, so some, some other. So these are some possibilities, but they are not really big, right? So if you look, um, New York Times is of course up there. I just checked, right? 2.4 million. The correspondent from Holland, the one that's funded, 56,000. Okay, not a lot in terms of being a big uh, operation. Uh, and FYI, this year, New York Times was more valuable than Singapore Press Holdings. I didn't know this, but Singapore Press Holdings have been more valuable for the longest time than the New York Times to this year, right? Okay, now um, I talked about the revenue side. Now, what about the reporting resources, right? How do we get more resources to reporters? So one common one uh, is on crowdsourcing. But again, this is uh, up to a point. You, those of you who have done this, you know that actually the average person is not very good at, at reporting, being accurate with facts, you know, observing things carefully and so forth. Most people are not. That's why you are journalists and they're not journalists, right? Just different, right? Um, some people have tried getting uh, reporters to do additional contributions, right? So video, for example, okay, uh, blogs. The video one, uh, the model that they tried where the reporter does sort of multiple platforms, right, has been shown not to work because it's very stressful on reporters and not everybody has a, has, like, has a television face. I don't have a television face, right? You know, right? If you have a face like mine, you call it, you call it a radio face, right? Okay, <laughs> you're good for radio, you look, okay, you look good on radio, right? Okay, so, and, and people find it very stressful uh, to do all three, so they've experimented. A few people can, to be fair, a few people can, uh, but not many people can. So, uh, that's up to a point. Blogs have been good. I noticed the local paper, they do have uh, people, you know, uh, the reporters writing blogs. And blogs are kind of interesting because then, oh, their thoughts and, you know, you always gather more information than you could use, so, you know, nice to have it uh, uh, go somewhere. There's this co-op co model, uh, but it's more about ownership. Uh, this magazine that I kind of came across, uh, what they did was to reduce the amount of, uh, of print that goes out. So from once every month to two, uh, once every two months, that reduces the print cost, your circulation cost, right? Uh, and this is this is this around. It's actually launched only last month. It's amazing. So you know we don't know verdicts uh, out on this. Okay, and then a French one. I thought uh, Just was going to talk about this. I just came across this. This is the um, okay. This is the Google translation of of uh, this page. So it's not it's not gross. It's probably the word probably raw, right? The word is not gross or, or gross. The first word there. It's a literal Google translation, copy and paste and translate, right? Social media is good for that, right? Um, but it's entirely video. Okay, it's new, so we need to see how this will actually turn out. So new sites, you know, uh, are, are coming up. Okay, my conclusion is on, on, on this, right? So from what you see, uh, it looks like there is no one model to fit all situations, right? Um, and so we do need to filter out to see which practices actually work. Uh, so it's interesting that they are still, actually we're still experimenting to see what might actually uh, uh, work. And, you know, it, pardon me for saying this, it's kind of obvious, but we do need to watch out for weaknesses. 
Uh, Sri made a point that in India they, are, they don't seem to be um, you know, moving on that front. Um, and it's interesting because I you know, did my research here, and I don't know whether this surprises you, most businesses will not act unless it's a crisis. I was flawed by that because I'm a planner. I plan ahead. I'm planning for my granddaughter. Only slight problems that my daughter is not yet dating a serious person yet. Right? I have only one daughter and not dating anybody yet, but I'm planning for my granddaughter already. So I'm a planner. Right? I cannot imagine running a business without looking ahead. And apparently, most businesses don't do that. So again, your AGF folks, when you go back, you know, we want your media to thrive. Plan. Plan, right? Um, and this final point is this, and, and in fact, I'm using this in my class. Uh, um, uh, this, I think an important point. You need an entrepreneurial approach to, um, to the media, I think, right? Okay, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial approach doesn't mean coming in jeans and t-shirt or black t-shirt, right? No, it doesn't mean that, right? It means, okay, and this is surprising to me, it doesn't mean being a genius either, right? It means being ready to pivot, to change, to do trial and error. You need to allow errors, okay? We need to allow mistakes, and then you must be able to switch, okay? Um, and somehow we have to work uh, within these constraints that you're, you're able to pivot quickly in the media. And, and in fact, we're going to discuss this point, right? That for big media companies especially, um, it is actually difficult because all, all kinds of dis disincentives to change, right? Because why change if things are going well, right? So, and, and then you see this coming, but we're still making money from the offline, more than online. So, why do you change, right? But this is absolutely critical. And in fact, um, the, among the, the students, we're going to talking, we'll be talking about this. How do these media companies uh, pivot? Okay. So on a note, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pankwa. I think um, um, this interesting presentation was a great way to, to start. It's a diagnosis of the uh, situation of the landscape of the media industry today. I think everybody will agree with you that uh, the traditional business model uh, is, is questioned, is challenged, and that uh, we need to, to find new ways to, to make journalism sustainable. Um, so we'll continue the, uh, the, the session with uh, some proposals for, for, for doing that. And uh, so I would like to now invite our second speaker on stage, uh, Mustafa Kasim, the CEO and uh, also marketing director of Roar Media. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here. Uh, so my name is Mustafa Kasim. I'm the founder CEO of Row Media. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about, I'm here to talk to you, I'm here to talk to you about vernacular content in South Asia and the scope for native advertising to sustain it. So, to quickly explain, Raw Media is a South Asia new media platform that creates premium content across five different languages and counting. Uh, we create content in Hindi, Bengali, Tamil, English, and Sinhalese, and we also create this content across various categories. Some of the categories can also include technology, women-related content, um, uh, histories, culture, uh, etc. So this is what raw media looks like for the last six months. This is how we have performed uh, based on all the content that we have done uh, over the last six months. We are a four-year-old company, uh, but I've put together data for the last six months. We have had 6,000 premium content pub uh, pieces published. This is including videos and articles. We have had over 230 million video views, 50 million article reads, uh, we have had about 250 million minutes of video watched, and the average time people spend on our website or our apps is about 10 minutes. And in total, this is across all social media platforms, on our website, on our apps, we've had over 150 million users who have uh, in some way consumed our content. So, what does the South Asian audiences, uh, South Asian audiences are set to change dramatically going forward? Um, as you all know, South Asia uh, has about 500 million internet users right now, and that is expected to grow to over 1.2 billion by 2021. A lot of the new users coming online are going to be non-English. So Google and KPMG re released a report stating that 
nine out of 10 new internet users are going to be non-English. And by 2021, we'll have over 800 million native language internet users in the region. And what do I mean by South Asia? I mean Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Afghanistan. Um, yeah, I think that covers South Asia. So what's causing this shift? Why are so many people coming online right now? As you all may know, uh, rising disposable income, there is a rising disposable income. Populations are growing in the region. Data has become a lot cheaper. We have companies like Reliance Geo who have uh, started to give out 4G uh, for free almost. Uh, in India, we have had uh, Bangladeshi 4G networks uh, being enabled in, uh, earlier this year. Um, and we also have digital and uh, smartphone literacy uh, by a lot of users who are coming online. So there are a lot of impact organizations, NGOs, who are teaching users how to come online. And I guess the biggest factor here is the entire ecosystem is getting localized, from hardware to telcos to uh, brand websites to organizations. Everybody is local localizing in local languages, which enables users to come online easier and faster. All right, so we have a lot of users coming online, but what's the problem? The problem is that this ecosystem is crippled with fake news, hate news, violent content, sexual content, listicles, sensational content, etc. And uh, some of the types of content that, uh, that pollute the internet right now is 10 things that show Priyanka Chopra is a common girl. Or India Shia leaders suggest Muslims don't eat beef. So it's, it's a lot of content that really doesn't drive enough value to users. These users are coming online to learn new things and get new content, new information. And uh, the problem is there is a lot of non-relevant content that's uh, polluting Facebook feeds, Instagram feeds, etc. And that's where Roe comes in. So we started four years ago uh, to cater to Sri Lankan English audiences. And uh, what we realized was there was a huge demand for vernacular premium content. And uh, so that's what we do. We do vernacular infotainment across five different languages, content that is mobile first and widely accessible, and content that is insightful, credible, and engaging. We always want users to take something away or learn something new when they consume our content. And this is who we target. We target South Asians who are the emerging middle class who primarily consume content in non-English. Average age is about 24 to 44, so not just millennials, but also, I guess, people who, uh, who are just getting online for the first time and want good content. And most of the, our users are urbans, and suburban audiences. The content that we do is uh, mostly short videos. So you guys would have seen this little text-based videos that go up on Facebook. Those are very popular. We do that with text and voice. We do in-depth articles, which are 750 words plus. And we also do a lot of original video shows, such as uh, talk shows, documentaries, explainers, etc. These usually span for about 10 to 20 minutes. So here's a couple of examples of the type of content we do. We did a Hindi video explainer explaining what happened du during Kim's and uh, Trump's summit in here in Singapore. There was a lot of confusion as to what they're going to discuss and a lot of uh, rumors going around. So we did uh, a very detailed explainer as to what is going on. Uh, during the World Cup, we did an analysis as to how Messi is going to help Argentina uh, if they need to win the World Cup. Uh, we talk about current affairs such as Egypt, uh, sorry, Europe's uh, refugee problem and uh, the end of German solidarity. We did this in Bengali. Uh, we did a Sinhalese article about technology, which is how 3D printing will help uh, aid humankind. All right, so there's been a lot of talk today about uh, monetization, and this has been one of our main primary challenges as well. It's easy to produce content and get users to consume a content, but then how are you going to make money from it? Um, I guess South Asia is probably has the lowest CPMs uh, in the world right now. Um, while Europe and the US have CPMs of about five US dollars, 
South Asia has CPMs of about 25 to 30 cents, if you're lucky. So it's very difficult to earn a lot of money through programmatic ads. Uh, we have uh, tried content as a service as well, and that's performing okay, but that doesn't fit into what our overall objective is. So content as a service is something where we use our resources that produce content, we create white label content for brands. It's a way of sustaining ourselves and helping us grow uh, and brings in cash flow. And a big majority of our content has come from native advertising. Um, I will explain what native advertising is. 75% of our revenue comes from native advertising. All right, so before I get into the types of native advertising there are, uh, let me give you some background to native advertising. 70% of people want to learn about brands through either native, uh, through, uh, they would prefer to learn uh, about a brand through native advertising rather than traditional advertising. And that's true, I would, I would much rather watch a, or read an article or a video that has very relevant content and then has a brand tie-in rather than watching a, play, uh, watching a commercial or looking at a newspaper ad. 53% of users say they are more likely to appreciate a native ad over a banner ad. And we see this over on our platform as well. When we have native content, we have click-through rates of about 5 to 6%. But if it's a banner ad, click-through rates are about 0.3%. 25% of global advertising budgets are set to shift from traditional to native advertising in the next four years. And we have seen this as well. Uh, in our company, we have a lot of big brands. One of the big brands we work with is Unilever's. In the region, Unilever's has started moving a lot of their traditional budgets to digital. So it's, it's good news. 80% of all internet traffic will be video by 2019. Video is seen as a preferred method of native ads. And again, this, this data is consistent to what we are seeing. Out of the 75% of revenue that's coming from native ads, 80% of that is video. So this is what native advertising looks like. Uh, if we were to do content in a couple different languages about top 10 Android apps of 2018, it'll be brought to you by Samsung. The imagery in the content will be Samsung phones, and we will have a very clear call to action saying, OK, if you're looking for your next Samsung phone, uh, Android phone, try buying a Samsung. They have great models. But the content itself is not biased towards Samsung. We're not saying not all these apps work only on a Samsung phone, or it's, uh, you have to have a Samsung phone to use these apps. The content is unbiased. We don't, we don't favoritize any apps in this content uh, just because of Samsung. And this is what we try and do. We try and have unbiased content that has very good information but also very strong brand type. For example, why are Japanese cars so reliable? Brought to you by Toyota. Or top five uh, destinations for experiential travelers in 2018. Brought to you by Airbnb. The content is not, is not altered because of the brand, but the brands get connected into the content. And that's what native advertising looks like. So that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mustafa. I think it's uh, it's definitely one of the uh, great aspects of, of new technologies and, and of the new uh, news publishing ecosystem to see that uh, technology actually allows uh, us to, to bring information to people who didn't used to have access to, to information. And, and your, your information content, for example, is mainly video, so which means that not only you, uh, you, you reach to some community that maybe didn't have a newspaper, but also to people that maybe cannot read but can still access uh, information on, on the video format, which was impossible before. So that's, that's uh, really interesting. And, and then your, your plea for um, um, native advertising, which is very interesting as well because, of course, as we know it's uh, one of the areas of advertising that, that sh sees growth and, and, and promises, but at the same time we know that there is this challenge between, okay, so how far can we uh, live on native advertising and at the same time preserve our trust and credibility, maybe this is something we can discuss uh, during the, the Q&A session. Um, I would like now to invite our next uh, speaker on stage. Uh, so please welcome Simon Park, the uh, content strategist of uh, Mediatip. Mm. 
Hello, um, I'm um, Simon Park. I'm from South Korea. As I um, was talking to Mr. Uh, Alan Soon uh, during the break, um, how many uh, of you are from South Korea? So uh, yeah, this is the problem. We are living in a small island behind this language barrier. And we, our media doesn't change. This is a big problem. And I'll show you how the problem started and how we are tackling this problem as a uh, new media accelerator, the only new media accelerator in Korea. OK. Um, I give you this quiz, a mystery. Ad blocker adoption rate is the lowest in Korea, in South Korea. I mean, the lowest, very lowest. That, uh, that, that mean some people will ask, uh, is Korean website really clean and no pop-up ads? Maybe, but it looks like this. Can you tell which one is actual article and which one is, this is current uh, situation in South Korea. The mystery is, if we have that kind of media website, why don't they use ad blocker? That's a question, right? Our question starts with this situation. This is what my, fam uh, my, my friends say. I cannot read online news when kids are around. Because, I mean, if you see on top of the uh, screen on the right, you can see what kind of uh, ads is this. And it's embarrassing to visit Korean news website while working with the Americans in office. This is actually what my friend said in Google. So uh, this is the question: Why do they? Uh, why don't they use uh, ad blocker? Because four percent of Korean uh, South Koreans visit uh, news outlets website to read news. Four percent. The second lowest is Japan, and that's a 16%. Why this weird phenomenon happens, right? By the way, 77%, whopping 77% who uh, use web portals or aggregation services for, uh, to read news. That's South Korean problem, really. So uh, people read online news like this. On the left, their own website. On the right, that's web portal. It's really clean, just text only. The other one, just filled with uh, pop-up ads. You cannot actually uh, click add X, right? It, it just moves around. So people don't go there, people go there, same article. Same thing, without Viagara ads, there's a clean article. So people go to uh, web portals, news aggregations, why do we have this kind of weird problem? While uh, the news websites, uh, the, the uh, uh, newspapers and uh, broadcasters, they, uh, they are just uh, complacent about the situation, uh, uh, web portals were um, innovating. They have different ways to make visitors stay longer, read more articles. They are trying their best, but the content creators, the newspapers, they are just doing nothing because their ad revenue is not ad revenue. That's Korean problem. Maybe some of your countries have that problem, but this is big problem. So um, we do consulting work with this big uh, broadcasting, one of the biggest uh, in Korea. And we created uh, this uh, social news website, news service, and we got uh, Ad revenue, we found this ad revenue while uh, building up this uh, uh, service for the broadcasting company. And, and we found this source of revenue and they think it's too small and they went directly to corporate and they got 10 times bigger ad revenue for the same uh, service. So basically, uh, big corporations and the government give the, their ad money 
without actually considering the effectiveness or, or CPM, they don't care. They just uh, take care of their problem, media problem. So the, 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 the core of the problem is their audience is not their customer. So this is the big problem. So um, when their audience, don't, I mean, their audience is not uh, the source of revenue, their, their viewership is not important. What's important is the relationship between big corporations like Samsung and Hyundai and uh, the government. They, get the, they, they, they can get this ad revenue. So uh, what, I mean, after that, we get this result. So I'm a trusty news media, South Korea at the end. That's, that's uh, the result. So at Mediati, uh, when we started to, um, I mean, we started two years ago. So it, it, it's been two years, but uh, we raised like 14 to 15 uh, startups now. And uh, um, among them, um, they are, I mean, 80% of them are uh, under 30. So when they come to us, they have this mindset of old media that oh, if we build a great uh, product, they will come. And we tell them, what about the audience? Do you know your audience? And they don't know because they, what they think is that they were preparing their education is all about getting to, into this big media. They, I mean, study for this exam, for this big newspaper. So what they think is about writing good articles and making great videos, not thinking about uh, the actual audience. So we uh, uh, developed this, not developed, we borrowed this uh, product field method that is, um, actually it's German product uh, development method uh, that, uh, uh, you need to actually see what's the problem that your users uh, uh, have. First, we ask them, who are your users, audience, the uh, customers and audience, if they are the same, who are they? And they all say, I mean, you know, they all say, millennials. No, millennials is not your audience. It's just age group. What? Where do they live? What's their income bracket? What's, the, what's their education? How long is their commute? All those things are actually uh, part of uh, users. So do they have problem with the current, uh, uh, what you're trying to do, current media? And then people say, oh, I don't know their problems. If they don't have any problems with current uh, media, you don't have to start uh, this startup. We actually discourage them. If you, find, if you don't find any problems, don't start your uh, startup. Do you have a solution? Who's your competition? And what is the uniqueness? What's so unique about your product? If you cannot answer these questions, you cannot start a company, start a media company, because that's all you need. Uh, so after that, we go through this, this is usually 80 minutes meeting. I mean, in the, in the first meeting, we go, this, go around these questions, and they, when they answered, and they go back to their um, audience research, and they bring up with new, uh, more polished ideas. That's how uh, we work. One of the companies, one of the first companies we uh, backed is uh, Dotface. Dotface. Uh, .kr. If you can, uh, if you're online, you can ju just visit now. It's uh, if you go to uh, YouTube, uh, uh, just uh, type uh, Dotface, and you will see many videos. Uh, when they came, they had this idea that. Uh, Korean media, news media, usually are made by over forty male, like me, they choose their news, this, this, this heavy news, and, and the millennials, they are not interested in these uh, news items that they, uh, the over 40 male picked. So they, what they, uh, we asked them, and then they asked their audience, what's your main concern? What, you, what do you want to read? And they said, uh, the animal rights, sexual uh, 
diversity and the, the minorities problem. All these things I mean, became their uh, main topic. And this is uh, what they got. I mean, after that, uh, they just uh, innovated after, I mean, just, just um, I'll give you this uh, example. They have this, um, I mean, it's a nickname, but Chief Audience Stalker. It's, uh, this Audience Stalker is the guy who actually reads uh, the uh, Facebook profiles of the users who visited their uh, Facebook page and their website and go after them and they find out what they are interested in, where they live, and they just find out it's an open information. So they just collected this and then uh, make a profile, their user profile, and then find out what's uh, more interesting uh, for them. This kind of work is what they do, and Geekbull is another one. Uh, this is uh, this is really young guys. He's 23, and he uh, made this uh, uh, service based on the idea that uh, Korean male teenagers, they want science news. I mean, there are great science shows on YouTube, right? But they are all in English, so um, they, they cannot understand. And then they, he, he wants to uh, build this uh, service. And one of their contents is that uh, there's um, a popular, hugely popular game, uh, Battleground in Korea. They say teenage boys all do this, Battleground. What, what he does is that he creates video um, like um, how to land the fastest way to this, uh, in this game and he uh, explains it really interesting way and um, uh, using this physics formula. So it's, it's working because people actually learn something without actually, I mean, um, uh, not from teachers, but the website. It's, it, that's how it works, because they studied the audience and they know, because um, what we, when we suggest uh, this uh, audience uh, research method, uh, people, at first, the people actually went, uh, went to the, uh, actually they didn't go to the audience and they just, just asked around uh, some friends. So uh, we actually asked them to invite this actual audience and talk to them for an hour and write a report. And some of the, the startups actually pivoted their contents totally, well, 180 pivoted because their audience didn't want their contents after they saw uh, audience research. And Korea Expose, it's, Korea Expose is one of these English, uh, English language Korean news service. This is the idea that if you go, if you read Korean news, it's really, the article is really so par because mostly this is industry secret, but um, the, the Korean news, uh, uh, English language news is actually same as Korean news, Korean articles translated with the help of native speakers in their form. So it's really bland and people read Korean news from New York Times and many other English language news, not actual Korean language news companies. So they decided, uh, they found this problem and they collected these great uh, writers who, um, contribute uh, to uh, New York Times and, and Al Jazeera. And so they create this uh, web news website. So these methods are all uh, centered on this one thing, the audience. So we believe the, at the center of media innovation is audience. And if you don't have audience, you don't have to start your company. If you don't know their uh, problems, you don't have any solutions. So we ask them to go to the audience and ask them, write down, otherwise you are not succeeding at all. Because that's the problem after all, from the start, uh, Korean um, media company. So that's uh, uh, the solution uh, we found after these two years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. So um, it's great. I'd like to, to congratulate all three speakers for, for having been very timely, very on, uh, on the dots. And so that leaves us plenty of time for 
uh, this Q&A session. So um, I, I'm sure you have many questions, and uh, so we, we will start to take questions uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, and for that, I'll invite you to, to go to the microphones in the, in the middle of the room. Uh, but maybe I will start with, uh, with a couple of questions myself to, to initiate this, uh, this debate. Um, I think we, we've seen it's, uh, it's great through, through Simon and uh, Mustafa's presentation, new players, uh, so we, we cover one part of this uh, session objective. Uh, I think we, with these new players, we, we can all discuss then uh, new models and, and new audiences. And new audiences was really at the heart of your uh, presentations, uh, um, all of you. And uh, with, with some contradictory uh, uh, elements maybe, because uh, Peng Hua was pointing out first that uh, the new generation is not reading news or is reading less news, do, so I'd like to ask uh, our, our speakers, is, is it something that you, you believe? Uh, and the second thing that Peng Hua was saying is that they are not willing to, to pay for, for content. And, and this is interesting because both uh, Mustafa and uh, Simon, you, you highlighted the importance of, of the audience and to bring relevant content to, to the audience, but um, none of them spoke about charging the audience for, for, for this content. Uh, I'd like to, to, to know if, if it's something that you, you don't believe in or that you think should come at some point. Um, so shall we start? I don't know with Mustafa, would you like to, to answer? Mm. Thank you. Um, so we have been thinking about the subscription model as well. And uh, while we think that uh, uh, monthly subscription uh, may be too expensive, uh, the model may not work, uh, one of the ideas we've been exploring is micropayments, where we charge uh, users or audiences uh, a very small sum of money, a couple of cents, to watch a video or to read an article. Uh, this is something that we have been exploring, and uh, one of the critical factors here is the payment method, because uh, we're dealing with audiences who have very low-tech devices. They usually don't have credit cards. So how do we get uh, these type of users to pay for content? Uh, and one of the ideas was to use telco billing. Mm. However, it's, it's still up in the air. I don't think a lot of people have done it and have been successful. So it's something to be seen. And I think if, if the model works, then that will pave way for a lot more media companies to start up with many different types of media. It will be a sustainable revenue source if it works. Yeah, that's, that's definitely interesting. And, and the differences between markets is very, very significant in, on, that, on that respect, on the, on the payment aspect. Um, Simon, would you like to? Uh, Actually, at Mediari, we uh, among these uh, 14, 15 um, startups, um, we tried like uh, two or three different methods. Um, what we found is uh, that if you are focused on sponsored content, I mean, with, I mean, keep in mind that this is really small South Korean um, uh, media scene, so the audience group is after it's not that big. So if with that uh, number of audience, uh, if you are like less than five people, if you have uh, added a staff, then sponsored contents will be enough, I mean, for them, uh, for them to uh, reach a BP, but to grow more than that, you need to uh, use a subscription model, and we are trying. And then, and the other one, the, the first one, the, the uh, dot face, they use this pledge drive. That's because this, their news is really social uh, uh, consciousness. It's, it's, uh, for them, Pledge Drive is uh, working way better than uh, sponsored contents. And uh, third one, actually, this is also actually a subscription model, but uh, we, the newest, two newest um, startups that uh, we just uh, decided to back, uh, they, uh, they are using this uh, newsletter model. So it's a paid newsletter. So we are trying these uh, new things uh, as we go. So we, we are trying to find the way, best way to um, um, support their staff. But uh, I don't think it will be solved in a couple of years. But 
In, in the meantime, uh, the, new, the, the old media, the legacy media, they are trying to find the sor their source, uh, as I uh, told, uh, uh, told you, it's, it's from the government and the big corporations. So in the, uh, we are still learning, and hopefully in, I don't know, in uh, several years, we'll find the best model, but uh, until then, the, the experiments will go on. Simon, I have a question. Uh, you, you were talking just now um, about the um, subscription model, and Sri had mentioned that the young people today seem to be more willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And as I reflected upon the years, my daughter uh, in the 20s uh, subscribes to Spotify and to uh, Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, is that a change? Do you, do you think young people today are more willing to, 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 to subscribe? Definitely. Um, this is uh, w what I find really interesting. Um, actually, I did a little uh, survey uh, among the uh, less than uh, 100 people group, and then, interestingly, millennials under I don't know uh, under 35 actually they are uh, they are trying uh, they are actually paying for four to five subscriptions. Among them are beer. Actually, beer subscription is popular, and flower subscription. They're not rich kids, but they actually do subscribe these flour, beer, and food, and on top of it, definitely Netflix and others. So they are really very familiar with uh, paying small amount of money because they are not trying to buy a house in the long run. They are not trying to getting married. And what they have is today, and they say, that's, that's what I heard, uh, they are saying, we are living this day, and I want this and this and this. I need Netflix, I need new flowers, I need new beers every day, then I'll pay them because I can survive. That's their mindset. It was interesting. I'm 47, so I don't really understand it, but yeah, that's, uh, that's their mindset. Just a quick comment that we probably want to keep the Singapore model away from the Koreans. We want them to get married and they buy houses. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, would, would, would there be some questions from, from the audience to, for, for our speakers? Don't, uh, don't be shy. The microphones are there. Um, anyway, while you think about it, I will, I will continue the, the, the conversation. Uh, a bit more, and I think um, I I would like to ask uh, all of you what you think. I mean, first I've I've seen through your presentations that there are things that are different for uh, legacy companies and for new startup. For example, in terms of monetization, as you just mentioned, Simon, if you're a five people team, then maybe you can make your news operations sustainable in a different way than a, than a legacy uh, media. So maybe we, we are facing different, uh, d d different problems here, but and at the same time, uh, we can bring relevant content and, and, and quality content with these different uh, models. But I think both are, are needed, of course. Um, what makes you more, uh, uh, what do you, you find when you, as maybe that's for, for you, Simon, in the first place, because you work with both companies. So what do you find more challenging in general in the, in the new media landscape uh, to, uh, today? What is, be, what is your, yeah, the, the, your, your, main, your main concern? For? Facebook algorithm, <laughs> that's <laughs> the biggest one. I mean, they changed this algorithm, I mean, this, uh, uh, I mean, January, I guess, and then um, the, the average reach dropped, like, I mean, cut by half, so it's a big problem. I mean, uh, they are the, the, I mean, what I'm trying to say is platform, uh, platform, platform companies are the one who actually make money, uh, uh, Professor Ang uh, 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 told us, so it's they they are they're making money and uh, we are kind of just I mean many startups not just startups but uh, just media in general they are just content providers they don't have their channel so the biggest thing biggest challenge I think is uh, building your own channel that's the the, the most difficult and. For now, um, for Korean media, they seem to, uh, I mean, have given up. 
at some point. They are uh, trying to uh, send this article, these articles to neighbor or big portals. So yeah, th that's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's true that the situation in, in South Korea, as you explained very, very clearly, is, is very peculiar, but is uh, symptomatic of uh, what we are seeing, is that um, a lot of media companies are not reaching their readers uh, directly and depend too much on uh, social media or other channels for, for reaching their, their, their readers. And uh, as Sri mentioned in uh, his keynote uh, this morning, probably that's not the, 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 the right way. I mean, you, you cannot depend on others to, to reach your, your readers. Um, so, um, yeah, Mustafa, what, what, what do you find uh, challenging? In your, in your business, you're an entrepreneur, you, you launch something and you're going, uh, your business is going well so far, but well, what is your, your worry and your main concern to, to continue to grow your company? So, the c main concern right now is what you just mentioned, uh, two things, right? How do we get? How do we not be too dependent on third-party platforms, especially Facebook, YouTube, etc.? Uh, like Simon said, only the platforms end up making all the money in the end, and the content creators have very little to share amongst themselves. And uh, so it's it's a it's a problem in itself. Number one is how do we get? Uh, how do we own the audience? Or how do we get audiences to come to you directly? Or how do you reach out to them without a third party? And number two is uh, how are we going to make money out of that? So uh, we have had some fair bit of success with native advertising so far. Um, I think the type of content that we do fits in very well to native advertising, but that's not very scalable, like Simon said again. It, it'll, it'll be good for a small team, uh, but when you're scaling up, if you, want to, if you want to replace the traditional media companies, if you want to become a big player, um, you need to go beyond uh, the sponsored content uh, avenue. So the big two concerns to answer your question is, number one is how do you own the audience? How do you, how do you get them to come to you directly or how do you directly engage with them? And second thing is monetization. Okay, so yeah, I think uh, regarding native advertising, that's uh, as I mentioned before, there we, we see this uh, uh, on the one hand, this growth, but uh, and on the other hand, your ambition is to to distinguish yourselves with uh, uh, quality content. So, do you do you see that it is a contradiction for you, or on the contrary, you you find that I mean, your the the kind of content you are uh, creating for brands is also high quality, and you find that your user understand that the the, the whole experience is is for them positive and, and creates trust into your your brand. So it's, it's actually mixed because if the brand, most brands want to be in the user's face, right? Uh, brands really don't understand how to do subtle marketing. They, they want us to, for example, we'll take Brand X, they want us to write about Brand X and tell our audiences as to how great Brand X is. But we don't really want to do that because then that's not, un that's not ethical and that really goes against what we're trying to achieve by providing credible, informative content. So what we try and do is write something around where Brandex is, uh, is playing in. So for example, if Brandex is a tech company, we'll write something around tech and then have them connected to that content. But then the brand also has a concern that they're not being prominent enough. The value that they're paying for that content is not, is not delivering enough effectiveness for them. So it is... Uh, it is challenging. It's not as easy and straightforward uh, as we think. Um, so, uh, however, there have been cases where we have done very, very good content uh, with uh, very strong brand tie-ins that are completely ethical and completely appreciated by users. This is an ideal scenario that we are trying to get to, but uh, having to balance an audience on one side and then a brand on the other side, it is, it is extremely difficult. Okay. Um, so to, to continue on the, on the question of uh, advertising, so Penghua, you're, you're, I mentioned before, you're, you're an advisor to, uh, to the advertising, uh, uh, is it regulator of, of Singapore? Or you, um, so you, you're, you're thinking about advertising models and formats. Um, so how do you see the, the evolution of digital advertising, native advertising, uh, as uh, one of the main revenue source for uh, news uh, publishers, but as you mentioned in your presentation, a declining source of revenue? Yeah. Um, the advertising side is, uh, is interesting um, because it's not, it's not a question of just getting, getting more advertising in this space. Um, and, and I 
which you wonder how Mustafa manages to balance, you know, uh, your your unbiased sponsored content, right? Um, in this space, what happens is that uh, because there's a tendency for the advertiser to to be a little loose with their claims, um, actually for the Advertising Standards Authority of Singapore, uh, the group I'm now a chairman of, um, uh, we regulate advertising on a self-regulatory basis. Um, and one one thing that I saw popping up was this issue of social media advertising. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting uh, story that, that I will tell you. Um, uh, what happened is that um, I expected some problems with this space because people were just making any kind of claim that they want. Uh, so we were getting ready actually uh, some guidelines uh, to, to put because you need to regulate this space, right? Uh, so we sat and we waited and then something blew up uh, concerning Singtel, the dominant, uh, the incumbent uh, telecom company. Um, there were some issues with the ads and the advertising budget dropped to zero for three months in the space. So we said, hey, you guys can talk to us. And of course they did, right? Because your advertising drop budget drops to zero because of no regulation in their space. Um, and so we talked to them and then you know, the, the guidelines are, have been adopted. Uh, but in the interim, another issue popped up. And again, the advertising budget froze, but this time for a month, right? So the social media uh, side, they could see why they need um, some kind of guidelines. These guys were like typically influencers, bloggers. Um, and so it's kind of harder, to, harder to, uh, to regulate because anybody can put up any kind of content. But the point is that you need some kind of regulation around this space so that you are seen to be ethical. And actually, if in advertising, if you, if you are not part of an advertising code, uh, the multinational companies will run away from you. Uh, we had a case where um, uh, some multinational company uh, refused basically to, to comply with um, the, the, the guidelines. I mean, they just said, just follow the letter of the law kind of thing to the client, and the facts accidentally came to us. Um, and we called these folks up, the uh, two heads of that company, uh, the ad agency, and we said, if you guys are, don't want to be part of the several regulatory agency uh, you know, body, you can leave. And they basically begged, uh, begged us not to, not to expel them, because if we did, the multinational clients would all run away from them. It's not half, it's not, it's not even 99%, it's all of them will run away from them. So I think, um, I don't know whether it's some kind of code that you have, because in this space, in order, in order to run the ad in the long term, we're talking sustainability long term, right? Not short term gain, right? Um, if you're here for long term. You need some kind of, uh, of guidelines, but in the form that um, it's, it's uh, flexible enough, so that's why self-regulation and not, not government regulation, yet recognizing kind of the realities of the market. So there's, there, there's always a tension. It's, it's not, sometimes you get blamed, you know, either both sides at the same time, for doing something that we all think is correct, but you can blame on both sides. And, it's, and we think that's about right to get blamed on both sides, right? We're trying to do good. Um, so I think that you need some kind of guidelines in, in, uh, in this um, advertising space online in order actually to grow in the, 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 the industry in the long run and to be more sustainable. So actually, I'd like to hear from, from, from Mustafa. How do you kind of manage your okay. unbiased sponsored content? So unbiased sponsored content is a difficult task, but uh, we really try to convince the brands to work with us on that and be patient because it takes time. Creating good content, not every, not every article that you do or video that you do is going to go viral. So you have to try multiple times and we try and convince brands about it. <clears throat> but I agree, I think there has to be a code of ethics. However, that code of ethics, uh, I think, should be uh, some type of government regulation because otherwise, if it's if it's uh, non-governmental, uh, then it uh, you you're going to have competition. Uh, for example, if we say no to a certain brand, uh, we can't do this for you because it's unethical. You're always going to have a certain other media brand that'll go and do it for them, uh, causing severe competition and an unsustainable uh, business model for us. Um, so. I would like to uh, hear more as to how we can go about and set out a, a code of ethics and how it will usually get set up. Okay. Yeah. Let's quick on before I guess uh, the, the first question, right, of the audience. Um, okay, so I did some research back by year 2000, uh, and so at this, at this framework, you can send some presentation slides and all that, the theory, the citation and all that. Um, the first thing is that you need a motivated industry. The industry must be motivated, and the people must be for it. If not, self-regulation will not work. Secondly, you need uh, actually a somewhat mature market, ideally, if not, you know, some, some issues there. You need a small number of large players, not a large number of small players, right? A small number of large players, and large players are in, you are pretty much safe. 
And then ideally also some government backstop, but again, that's not essential. If you guys are motivated, uh, most people sort of, the small number of large place means that most of our industry is self-regulated, then, then you're safe. So actually it can, it can work to, to, to a great extent, I would say. Yeah. So we have a, a question here. Could you please introduce yourself and, and then ask Hi, good the afternoon. Question. I am Roger from the Philippines. I work as a radio broadcaster. And I also manage a station. Uh, I'm quite fascinated with the way things are being discussed here, but I'm uh, a little bit alienated because everything is about audience and readership online. But uh, may I know from the prospect of the panels, uh, what would be your suggestion or recommendation how radio would still be relevant in this digital age? Of course, we are into mobile age as well. We embrace uh, uh, radio. With technology, we, we have our own video and audio sharing. Uh, as uh, Mustafa would have said, we also have our native advertising. And uh, advertisers would advertise in native dialect, like uh, in the Philippines. Uh, we have so many uh, languages, so as much as uh, many languages, they, they advertise us in dialect. So may I know from the panel, how could we be relevant in this digital age for radio? Thank you. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Sure. Actually, um, uh, this is uh, the we believe in, uh, at Mediati. We believe this is um, audio contents renaissance because of two things: um, a podcast and this AI speakers. So we are uh, researching on these two things. And podcast is um, it's amazing. I, I'm a fan, big fan of uh, podcasts, especially American podcasts like uh, NPR. Uh, make it creates great uh, podcast and there are uh, uh, gimlets that's uh, uh, also uh, kind of branch of this uh, uh, NPR podcast team and then the, the gimlet has great model and what we believe is that um, as Asian country I mean we all share the same problem this big huge uh, um, city and young kids are just commuting longer and longer so what they have I mean, even they are driving, they have, we have this ear, and then they, that podcast is most personal media you can get possible, because usually you are the only one, so it's really powerful. And then they say, the Gimlet media, they say the, the, the advertising works well because um, they have their own ear, and then they, they actually talk to themselves. I mean, all those, um, the, the uh, 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 podcast people, they don't try to make uh, uh, their uh, the uh, advertising uh, material believable. They just say it. But when they say it, they they use their own voice. And I, this is what I found. I found myself listening to the same ad over and over, even when I can just, just skip. But it's because it's someone I listen to, I just listen to them. I and mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, actually. And the AI speakers, it's just, it's just it's the beginning of the AI speakers, and we don't know what's the uh, uh, capability yet. But uh, I think it's growing, and um, more than any other media, I think audio contents have a um, future. That's, yeah, my... <coughs> Yeah, I would just a, some quick comments. Um, I think radio, globally speaking, is always single digit as a percentage of market share. So we expect single digit and typically around 4 to 6% uh, globally speaking. And I agree with Simon, it's typically uh, prime time listening. Although I should add that in my case, I listen to audio books, so I don't listen to the radio that much. Uh, podcasts, of course, yes, I agree. And then something very important, critically important for radio, for emergencies. Okay, the research has shown this app probably the best medium out there for emergency. So your mobile phone, even if they are working, your towers are down, there's no use. But the radio in your phone will be really, really helpful. So you have a very critical role You're from the Philippines, absolutely critical uh, medium. And uh, be before uh, letting uh, Mustafa comment, I would like to, to say that uh, from our perspective, I mean, I fully agree that, I mean, we, we see a resurgence of the, of the podcast and then of the audio content. And of course, from Google's side, uh, there is the uh, uh, audio search that is that is uh, growing uh, very much. So and and we are building from the news on the assistant. So uh, more and more, it's it's not a text search and it's not a, a, an article that I read, but uh, it's uh, asking uh, Google Assistant, okay, what's the news today or what's going on 
in uh, South Korea and listening to, to a podcast that, that has been, uh, or, 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 an, or a news article that, that has been curated by a, a news publisher. So, so definitely, I mean, it's, uh, audio content is super important. Thanks. Um, so, to be honest, I don't really know much about uh, radio or audio, but uh, from what I understand in South Asia, uh, voice is, is the next big thing that's supposed to come, but it still hasn't come. Uh, people keep talking about it. Uh, peop uh, podcasts are not as frequently as listened to as mature markets like South Korea or Singapore or even the United States. Um, mostly, I think users are just coming online, so we are about five years behind the curve. And uh, I think users are still exploring YouTube and video content. So while I think uh, Google is pushing very heavily in terms of voice, in terms of in India, um, I still don't see there is enough traction there, and I don't understand it enough. I see. We have another question here. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my name is Zafar Subhan. I'm the editor-in-chief of Dhaka Tribune. It's a national English language daily uh, published out of Bangladesh. My question is for Mr. Kasim. And uh, I'm very fascinated by the model of raw media. And I just had sort of a couple of questions, clarifications on that. Uh, you mentioned that, a, I think you said 75% of the revenue comes through uh, native advertising. So my, it's a, my first question is, how much of your content therefore needs to be native advertisement? And then how much of your content can be generated other than that? And then the second question is, um, how do you get your content you know, out in front of an audience. So you create this fantastic content, and of course, the success of the content depends on as many people as possible actually uh, seeing it, viewing it. What strategies do you have to then get that great content in front of people's eyes? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so for the first point, um, the number of sponsored content that we can do, if it was an ideal case scenario and the type of content that we do, we could have potentially, in the idealistic world, we can have all our content not sponsored, but branded. Where, for example, if you're talking about anything, any, any knowledge information you're giving in, there will always be some brand that has relevance to it and you can have them tied in. As long as that brand is not being asking you to be uh, biased or if they're trailing you to tell uh, the audience what they don't want to hear, uh, then I guess you're fine. Um, however, that's not the ideal case. Uh, sometimes we need to directly promote a brand or if you directly promote one of their services or do a review for them. In that case, we try to do one in five to be sponsored and uh, five to be uh, organic or editorial. Um, so, so we're trying to really differentiate between sponsored content and branded content. So sponsored is where we are talking about a brand or talking about a service, a branded content is where we're talking about any editorial topic just with a brand tie into it. So that's number one. And uh, number two is uh, in Bangladesh, uh, Facebook has been a very, very effective uh, tool for us. Uh, if you go to an uh, average Bangladeshi and you ask them, do you use the internet? They're going to say no. But you ask them, do you use Facebook? They'll say yes. So they have become, they're not gone through the entire cycle that uh, the other parts of the world have gone through where they discover web browser and desktop browser and mobile browser. They immediately jumped onto Facebook and WhatsApp. So uh, Facebook has been a very, very important tool for us in Bangladesh, and now YouTube is also catching on. As you know, 4G networks are now active. That gives people more data, and they are consuming a lot of content. Okay, are there any other questions from, from, from the room? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, from SCMP. Hi, I'm. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, I'm Yonan Latu from the SCMP. Uh, my question is for uh, Simon. I I couldn't help, uh, you know, feeling your sense of frustration about the language problem in Korea, especially with English. You were saying Korean news is read by, uh, you know, it has to be provided by producers like the New York Times. Um, from a Hong Kong experience, I would tell you that uh, our reporters are not native language, uh, native English speakers. So we don't see them as writers, per se. We see them as information gatherers. They go out and collect the information. Of course, it's not just raw information. They, know, they need to know how to craft it into a story form. But beyond that, we have a line of copy editors whose job is to transform that uh, language into something that's interesting for everyone. And we have a line of sub-editors whose job is to make sure that 
there are no grammatical errors and you know, literals, etc. So we've kind of got a grip on this problem, if you want to call it a problem. Uh, we're not, we haven't perfected it, but we know how to deliver a message that way. So what is the problem in South Korea? Is it, is it a matter of attitude towards the language? Um, the, uh, there's a really strict um, type of writing that um, they um, used, they have used for decades. When I was in college, uh, I was, uh, uh, yeah, actually at that point, I wanted to be a reporter. And I, uh, I saw, saw this, uh, my, my, my seniors, they have this uh, big careers ahead of them. And then they told me that you have to perfect your writing, the, the newspaper style writing. And this sounds weird, but they have this kind of style that you follow and then your own personal style goes away and you have to write, I mean, it's, it's almost anonymous writing after all. It's just a fact face, it's a, a thing that you do and if you're going to, I mean, let's say, a 30, 30 yeah, a female um, reporter who was 38 uh, came to me and uh, she asked me about starting her own um, a website. Uh, he wa she wants to uh, leave her uh, uh, newspaper company and then she, uh, I told her, do you have an audience? The same question, do you have an audience? Do you have your own uh, um, uh, set of problems to solve? And then she told me that after more than, I mean, 15 years, 10, more than 10 years of um, uh, uh, as a reporter, she don't know how to write uh, her own with her own voice. This sounds weird, but they lose their voice and they follow this strict anonymous style of writing. When it's, it is uh, just translated into English, it's what you get when you look into, this, I cannot say this name, those, those Korean uh, English newspapers, that writing came from that. So that's a problem. And one time, I this, pissed me off really badly. Uh, one of the, the editors, uh, business editors, uh, I met him like five months ago and he told me that they are not worried about their future because they have audience uh, overseas. So what do you mean audience? You, no one reads your news. I mean, I didn't say it directly, <laughs> but she, what he said is that they, I, I know they don't read all, all day, but when we break some news about Samsung, they will read it because it's breaking news. And we have that so we can get Samsung's advertise money. So that's their mindset. If, that, if that's their business model, so be it. But with that, they are not innovating at all. That's... Yeah, my rent, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. We, we have a question here at the back. Mm. Hi, I'm Kate, I'm from Twitter. Um, I thank you very much for sharing the really, really interesting um, examples. It's been fascinating to hear the different models that people are sort of uh, are looking at. I sat in a very similar session in Australia a couple of months ago, and something that really struck me is that um, in that session, there was a lot of talk about similar challenges around ad blockers, people skipping ads, um, consumers not so willing to kind of engage with this stuff. And so I guess something that's really sort of struck me is, is there a need to bring the advertising industry into the tent? Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone from that industry present today, but there wasn't anyone in the room at the last session that I sat in. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just wondering from an innovation perspective if that's something, you know, I think for a very long time we saw people just trying to plug and play ads from television onto digital platforms and that doesn't really engage people and, and you know, particularly a, millenni a millennial audience I just scrape through into that category. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what your views are on that um, and if there's any particularly great examples of where you've seen people um, really innovate from an ad format perspective. Uh, 
Uh, well, no, I think it's okay, but let's, let's uh, one by one. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, let, let's try to make a very brief answer because, yeah, we have two more questions and, uh, and uh, four minutes, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Okay, Mustafa, please start. And, uh, uh, okay. then. Um, I think that's a very interesting idea where you get the advertising community actually involved. Um, and I think even in forums like this, it might be helpful to get uh, people who actually control a lot of the um, what a, a lot of the budgets to get involved and to understand. Okay, how exactly could journalism and content creation and media? How exactly could they leverage that in an ethical fashion to reach their target audiences? I think. What, what is really lacking from, from my experience when talking to advertisers and selling is that they just don't know how to do it. All they know is, all right, let's create a video about our product. But we're like, no, we could do a lot better than that uh, and let us show you how. So I think the ad industry is willing to learn, they're willing to uh, really understand uh, how things will be better and it's a, it's, I think it's a great idea to get them also involved in the in, in these types of conferences. And I, I don't really know uh, how uh, anybody who has mixed really journalism with advertising yet, but that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, this is what is great also about being in the industry at the moment is that not only content is being reinvented and the business models and everything, but every part of the, of the ecosystem and, and the advertising as well is being reinvented and, and we still don't know what it will be to, tomorrow. Uh, it's a very uh, small example, but um, as uh, old media uh, doesn't, uh, they don't do well on uh, Facebook or other uh, platforms. Uh, in Korea, Korea, Korean companies, they uh, are creating their own newsroom and they use it, uh, use their own channel. So they do away with the agencies. So the agencies are closing because they just uh, skip these two uh, middle guys and just they go directly. So that's one way to deal uh, uh, for Samsung and Hyundai or, or other big companies are doing right now. So I hope it helps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So uh, maybe we'll take one last question. So that, that would be uh, Juni. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just very quickly about ad formats. Uh, the IAB actually prescribes the formats. So those are standardized. But in terms of uh, content, yeah, there, there's quite a few issues there. Uh, I want to pick up the point on what Ping Hua said about uh, ethics. So uh, the code of ethics, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because actually a PR company has taken the lead on this. If you Google uh, 2013 uh, Edelman sponsored content report, Edelman actually had already considered the issue and because they are advising their clients on media relations and how to get you know, um, earned media and, and of course nowadays there's paid media as well which is sponsored content, Edelman actually has uh, come up with a very comprehensive uh, sort of set of guidelines uh, from five years ago and, and every year they kind of like, uh, there is some thought leadership in this space. Um, but it's weird that a PR company should be taking the lead in this. So I would really urge... Um, uh, I, I, you know, internally for raw media, you've got a lot of native advertising at 75% of your revenue. Uh, in t do you separate the teams that produce uh, you know, new, uh, news editorial content versus uh, native advertising? That's one thing. The other thing is uh, if there's interest in, in coming out with a sort of an internal sort of, or Asia-wide code of ethics uh, with regards to sponsored content, uh, I'd like to urge you to come and talk to me during lunch because I think that it's, it's really possible at, at, re at the regional level to uh, bring together all your, uh, you know, sponsored content teams and, and advertising teams uh, to come come up with a code of ethics like what Bing Hua had suggested. The other thing maybe for, for um, Simon's uh, folks to consider perhaps is startups can also start thinking about media tech and ad tech uh, and developing technologies around it so that media companies are sort of... Uh, in charge or like take matters into their own hands to build the systems that that work for them perhaps that's something they may want to consider mm -hmm. any who would like to, to comment all right mm -hmm. um so thanks for the question um and um sorry, how was it? Where did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Our oh, separate teams, all right. <laughs> um, so yes, actually we do have separate teams. Uh, journalists hate to work on sponsored content, so the, yeah, how much have we pay them, they're not gonna do it. So, so you, you need to have separate teams. One is a content team, or the content creation team, and then one's a journalistic team that creates editorial content. Um, and even, even so much so that our video teams, graphic teams, everything is really split up into two, where you have one team doing uh, content specifically for brands, 
and then you have one, one team that's doing completely editorial content. Yeah. Um, yeah, would you like to comment? Uh, not specifically. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, for us, um, while uh, we work as a consultant, uh, it's uh, hard to um, explain the importance of developers and tech uh, people um, uh, to this old media. But on the other hand, when we work with Google Korea on this um, Google News uh, Fellowship, uh, they, we find young people, these tech people and these uh, the reporters, they come to us and they, they don't want to, they don't want to work uh, among them, among their people. They always want to, to cross uh, over to work with other people. So the tech guys always want to, wants to work with designers and reporters. That's, there's a hope. So they, they always want to separate. So they, 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 they I mean, I mean, uh, we actually tried to put these uh, two developers in one team and they didn't want uh, the other uh, developers because all they wanted was just working with uh, uh, these reporters uh, to create this beautiful um, uh, data uh, uh, website and then they needed this kind of researchers. I mean, as younger they get, they just cross over and they work together very well. So I think that's that's the hope I get. Okay, Frank, you want to say one word? Comment uh, um, that in this area, it looks like maybe we need to rethink some of our ethics as well. We think we want to draw a clear line between um, your advertising and your editorial. But it looks like there is some blurring of boundaries here. Um, and we may need to redefine this area, how much of it you're allowed to kind of uh, blur or sort of be aware of regarding the advertising side if you are a journalist. To what extent should you be considered, um, uh, should, you should you consider some of these uh, issues that they face in the advertising front? And how can you work together, yet still maintaining the integrity of the news? That's keep us occupied and employed for a while, hopefully. Thank you, and, and uh, one last uh, comment. Oh, okay, so very, very briefly. Yeah, because, uh, 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 this is Adil Shakot. I'm actually an uh, Asian Journalism Fellow this year. Uh, so uh, I'm working as a journalist for the last nine years. Why I'm describing this? My question is going to Mustafa. I have just gone through, I mean, the Roar Media content and all other things. So, I mean, my question to you is how do you explain your media? I mean, uh, what types of media this is? And, uh, I mean, uh, and do you still think you can be able to make the people to pay uh, for the contents published in the rural media? Uh, because, I mean, uh, I didn't find any kinds of uh, news or stories, I mean, uh, uh, what we cover as a journalist. So my question to you, how many reporters do you have? How many big events do you cover? I mean, uh, so far you covered. That is my question. And my question to others is like, I mean, all of us are praising about uh, New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, but um, can, you, can you give us an idea how the Asian med media can become profitable, uh, I mean, and, and attract the Asian readers or world, world leaders, uh, readers, I mean, through very good content like uh, New York Times? Thank you. Okay, so you have yeah. one, one minute. <laughs> so, um, so we, in terms of non-English content that we do, we are not a journalistic platform. We call ourselves a content player, and what we do is infotainment content. So just to give you an example, the type of content you'd usually see on National Geographic, on History Channel, on Science Channel, that's the type of content that we do. Content that educates and informs audiences, and uh, how we put out this content is through our website, through our app, Facebook, uh, YouTube, etc. And whether users are gonna pay for it, we don't know. I, we really hope they do, but uh, we're still not sure. But uh, one thing is for sure, there is a lot of free content out there, so getting users to pay for short-form free content is going to be extremely tough. So I think we need to really uh, create long-form, more premium content in order to attract people to pay for it. And um, th thank you, Mustafa. And I, I think so. We are a bit behind schedule, but uh, um, so I don't know if you want to comment in, in 30 seconds how to make the Asian media profitable. <laughs> That's maybe a bit a bit uh, uh, challenging, but we can continue probably the conversation over uh, over lunch. 
so I'd like to, to thank you again for, for, for this discussion, and uh, I uh, let the mic to, to Carol.